In everything we've done so far, in output markets and in input markets, we've implicitly assumed that both sides of the market have the same information about what's actually being traded. But that's not always true in the real world. Many markets are characterized by what we call asymmetric information. One side of the market knows more about what's being traded than the other side. Suppose, for example, we go back to Puddle Town from early on in the semester, where Sybil and Basil are trading fish for barley. They've identified a trade, seven fish in exchange for two and a half bushels of barley. And they both think it's a good trade. They both think they'll be better off as a result of the trade. But now imagine that barley is the kind of good that you have to work with for a while in order to be able to tell whether it's good barley or bad barley. You can't just tell by looking at the barley. In that case, Basil, who is the one who's selling the barley to Sybil, has more information about what's being traded than Sybil does. He's had a chance to harvest the barley and to work with it, and to know which batches are good and which ones are not so good. Sybil doesn't know that. But what she does know is that Basil knows, and that concerns her. Because what she's worried about is that rather than end up with a fair, random selection of the barley that Basil harvests, she'll end up with what's from her perspective an adverse selection of barley. A selection of barley that just includes the bad barley and not the good. That would make the deal that used to look good not look so good anymore. And so Sybil might decide not to trade with Basil. Basil might have no intention of actually using the information he has in this way. He might have every intention of selling to Sybil a random selection of the barley he's harvested. But Sybil doesn't know that. What she does know is that Basil has enough information to take advantage of her. And as a result, she might not trade with him. And if that trade doesn't happen, a trade that could have made both of them better off doesn't happen. A trade that could have produced surplus doesn't happen, and so we have a deadweight loss. That's the fundamental problem with asymmetric information in markets. The less informed party is worried that the more informed party is going to use that information to their advantage. So let's take that basic insight into a market that you might know a little bit more about. The used car market. You might have heard that when you buy a new car, that car will lose 15% of its value as soon as it's driven off the lot. That seems crazy. Why would a car lose 15% of its value just because it's been bought and driven off the lot? It's the same car as it was before. But the fact that this is true has led to one of the most famous papers in all of economics. It's often referred to as the lemons paper. It's not because it's about lemons that you make lemonade out of. It's because it's about defective cars that we often call lemons. Imagine, for example, that I have bought a new car three days ago and you are about to go to that same dealership and buy that same car for that same price that I paid. But I come to you and I say, I'd be willing to sell you the car that I just bought for a 3 to 4% discount. Would you be willing to take that deal? And at first it sounds like a pretty good deal. But then you get suspicious. What is it that's causing me to sell a car that I just bought at a price below what I paid for it. Did I find something out about the car in those three days? Did I find a hidden defect that you might not be able to see? Did I discover that car is a lemon? Well, now that that thought has occurred to you, a 3-4% to discount might not be enough for you to take the risk that you'll end up with a lemon. You might need a much bigger discount, like a 15% discount. And that's ultimately why new cars lose so much value when they become used cars. The fear is that the reason the new cars select into the used car market is that they have something wrong with them. The fear is that there's adverse selection of cars into the used car market. And for the same reason that Sybil might not be willing to trade with Basil, you might not be willing to accept my deal because you're afraid that I'm taking advantage of you with information that I have which you don't have. So we can see that asymmetric information 
might cause trades that could make both people better off to not happen and for that surplus to not emerge. But the consequences can be even more dramatic than that. In some instances, it could be that asymmetric information causes certain markets to not exist at all. Let's think, for example, about the unemployment insurance market. Suppose that I go to my State Farm agent and I say, in addition to my homeowner's policy and my car insurance policy and my life insurance policy, I'd like to buy an unemployment insurance policy. What I would discover is that there is no such policy for sale. The market isn't offering it. Now in the US and in many Western countries, the government is providing unemployment insurance to everybody. And that might be the reason that there is no market for such insurance. But it also might be that the reason the government is providing unemployment insurance to everybody is because the market would have a difficult time doing so. So why might that be the case? Well, think about lining up people from those who have a very low risk of being unemployed to those who have a very high risk of being unemployed. Now, there are all sorts of reasons that different people will lie on different parts of this continuum. Part of it might be that certain jobs have higher risks of unemployment than other jobs. I'm a tenured university professor. The chance that I will lose my job is essentially zero. So I would be on this end of the spectrum just because of the job I have. Other jobs are more fluid. New technologies make certain jobs obsolete. Some jobs come and go with the business cycle. But employees know a lot more about what kind of job they have and what risk is associated with it than the insurance companies do. It also might be the case that certain employees are really pivotal, pivotal to firms. They're such good employees and they're so productive that there's no way the firms would ever let them go. But other employees aren't as pivotal. And again, it's very hard to tell for an insurance company which kind of employee you are, how valuable you are to the firm, and how likely that you are to be able to, to, to lose your job. So the employee may know a lot more about that than the insurance company does. And the insurance company is worried about one other thing. They're worried about what we call moral hazard. Moral hazard is the change in behavior that it might emerge from a change of incentives that someone faces when they enter a contract. So if you get unemployment insurance, it suddenly becomes less costly for you to lose your job. After all, you're going to get unemployment benefits when you lose your job, which you didn't before. That might cause you to engage in different behaviors on the job. It might cause you to show up late at work, to not put in as much effort, and thereby you might become at higher risk of losing your job. Other people, of course, might engage in no moral hazard at all. They will behave exactly the same on the job once they're insured as they did before. But there's no way for the insurance company to really tell which kind of employee you are. Are you in going to engage in a lot of moral hazard if you get the insurance, or are you not? So all of those factors will cause employees to lie on different points of that spectrum. And employees know a lot more about where they lie than the insurance companies do. Now imagine that you're an insurance company and you think that you're going to get a random selection of people from this continuum. Then you'd be able to calculate what premium you would have to charge for the unemployment insurance in order to be able to have enough money to pay out the benefits that you'll owe to those who lose their jobs. But is it really reasonable to expect that you'll get a random selection of people from this continuum? Will the university professor that's tenured really buy your unemployment insurance? The answer is no, he doesn't need it. He's not going to lose his job. So there's a segment of low risk employees who will not be interested in buying unemployment insurance and so they're going to drop out of the market. That's going to create adverse selection of higher risk people into the insurance market. As a result, the insurance companies are going to have to charge a higher premium 
to be able to afford to pay out the benefits they're going to owe to those who become unemployed. And as those premiums go up, there'll be another segment of relatively low-risk workers who say, well, it was worth buying the insurance at the old price, but at this new price, it's really not worth it, so they're going to drop out of the insurance market. That creates more adverse selection, which puts more upward pressure on the price of premiums. And as those premiums go up, there'll be another set of moderately risky workers who will decide now the insurance is really not worth it. It's too expensive. And so they're going to drop out of the market. But that causes more adverse selection. It causes premiums to rise more. And another section of this continuum drops out of the market. And you can see how the entire market might unravel because of this increasing adverse selection. So now we can see that it's not just that asymmetric information might cause people like Sybil to not engage in trades because they're worried about the more informed party using that information to their advantage. It's also that entire markets might have problems existing if the adverse selection problem from asymmetric information is severe enough. 